things. People have tried the Vegemite. You'll know who they are because they have Vegemite breath. And, but if you would like to go and pat the kangaroo afterwards or get a little spoon, don't put your finger in it, but get a little spoon and try the Vegemite afterwards, you should. Okay, you're welcome to. There's plenty there to go around. And the braver you are, the bigger your scoop. Because those little things are memorable things about you. You know you're somewhere and you're trying something different. And that way you can say, I've tried Vegemite. And some of you have tried it. You go, I'll never do it again. But at least you tried it. So tonight, I want to build on what we started this morning, talking about a new identity. And this evening, we're going to talk about a new prayer. We're going to still be in that same passage in Colossians chapter number 1. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I also want to be respectful of your time, so I'm not going to rush through this evening, but at the same time as I'm not going to belabor it and, and things. But I know that you are here and you want to hear something from the Word of God and you want to be also encouraged. So I, that's my goal, is to encourage you tonight and to give you something to build on and to grow in. This morning we talked about discover your identity is in Christ and Him alone. And when we trust in Christ, we trust in Him and alone for our salvation. And there's so many various things that are vying for our attention. There's so many different things that can possibly distract us. And things that can take years, or if not decades, and we look back upon our life and going, oh, I wish I would have. And so rather than looking back upon our life and going, you know, I wish I would have, how about we start today and we say, here's how we're going to continue to move forward in the love of God. Now, you as a local church, you have a reputation. You know, I I said this morning, I've heard of you. And now I've met you. And you have a reputation. And we talked about the fact that we have faith and love and hope, and that God has called us to not just remain in that faith and love and hope that we now have through Jesus Christ, but we're called to grow in it. We're not called to remain the same, and we're not called to shrink. We're called to move forward. And in that passage in Colossians chapter number four, sorry, Colossians Colossians one, verses four and five, it says, since we heard, the apostle Paul says, I've heard of you of your faith in in Christ Jesus and the love which you had for all the saints and the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Well, we're going to build on that this evening, on that same passage, and move a little bit further down in the chapter. And we're going to see that in Christ, not only do we have a new identity, we also have a new prayer for ourselves and for others. So the way that we view ourselves and the way that we view others begins to change because we have this new identity. And as a result of that, because we're in Christ, we are now living life totally different. If you scan down that passage a little bit further down, you'll see in verse number nine, it says, since the day we heard it. You remember earlier, it says, I've heard of you. And so rather than going, I've heard of you, that's nice. He says, I've heard of you, and now I'm praying for you. And one of the joys I have as as a missionary is when people tell me, and I think I believe them, and they say, we will be praying for you. Now, I realize that's a very kind platitude, but I believe you. And what are you supposed to be praying? And then turn that around. What are you supposed to be praying for yourself and for your, your community around you? There's lots of things we could possibly pray for. There's lots of things we could say, you know, pray God helps the weather. Yeah, it would be nice if it was warmer. And you know, pray God you know, that we have food and we have water. And pray that you know, if you're taking a test tomorrow at school, pray God that God will bring to my mind everything that I studied and did not study. And you know, just give you inspiration. There's lots of good things that we can pray for. And Paul here gives us some clarity. It's a good thing to pray, husbands and wives, to be praying for one another in your spiritual growth and praying for your relationship. Your parents and children, if you have young children, it's amazing how you instantly learn to pray. And you pray for your children. You pray that they will come to know Christ. They'll be safe and they'll be secure. Your family and friends, it's important to pray for one another. Missionaries and pray for missionaries and pray for the lost world. You just sang a tremendous song about caring for the lost world around us. But Paul here, while he's in a Roman prison, and we realize that he had some freedoms there. He wasn't under lock and key, but he was under arrest. 
I believe coming to the end of his life, he had some clarity. And when you sit with someone that has some clarity, you want to pay attention. The Apostle Paul here is saying, I've heard of you, and since the day I've heard it, I haven't stopped praying for you. Now, what is he praying for, and what can we apply to our lives? And as we do this, I'll tell you some stories about our ministry in Australia, and and, because that's what I like talking about. But it's also to encourage you in what you're doing here in Finley, Ohio. Let's read verses 9 through 12 of Colossians 1. It says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord into all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. And verse 12 says, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We're going to see two things this evening talking about our, our prayer. And first of all, it says in verse number 9 about being filled. That's our first point. If you have the notes, you'll follow along. That's your first point there. It says, be filled. It says, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and desire that you be filled. Now, you're always going to be full of something. You want to make sure that you're filled with the things that are good things. And I looked at that word filled. And sometimes we think of the word filled as in we've eaten a little bit and I'm full and I'm totally stuffed. And then you go to the buffet. Coming from Australia, we don't actually have the all-you-can-eat buffets like they do here. And one of the things my children have asked, we will, we will allow them to, we're going to take them to one of these all-you-can-eat buffets and watch their eyes get big when they realize they can go back for more. And you, when you are highly motivated, you go back and you continue to eat more. But if you are a seasoned buffet eater, you realize there's certain things that they feed you that are fillers, that are just there to fill you up. You want to go for the good stuff, go for the protein. It's, and that word there, actually in the Greek, that word filled, doesn't just mean filled. It actually means crammed. And it means that you are totally filled completely. There's nothing more you can fill up with. So you go to the buffet. Now, I'm not an experienced buffet person. Maybe you can educate me later on the correct technique. But you realize that there's a lot of things. You don't want to fill up with carbs. You don't want to fill up with water. You want to fill up with the good stuff and the expensive stuff. And make sure that you're full. And all the other stuff you can kind of fill between the gaps. That's what it's talking about here with being filled. It doesn't just say, I came to church, I sat, I sang, I shook a couple of hands and I left. I guess that's what filled is. This is talking about you are filled and you are stuffed and you're crammed full of what? So Paul here is saying when we pray, we're praying that we're not just going through the motions of church. We're not just going through another, another week, another month, another year, but saying we are coming with anticipation that we're going to be crammed, filled with what? So there's some things we see. There's four things we see. First of all, it says knowledge. Verse 9 says, Desire that it may be filled with the knowledge of his will. One of the joys that we have is that we have the ability to know there's a God that loves us. And that changes absolutely everything. And that knowledge gives us a hunger to continue to know and to do the will of God. As believers, we don't have a, a, a new faith. What we're called to as believers, we're not called to continually have a new faith. We're called to grow in that faith. And we never arrive spiritually. Something I'm discovering as I begin to compare and see differences and you begin to study people is you realize how lost people actually think. And something that we're all guilty of, of our sinfulness, but you see when a person is truly, un, they don't know what they don't know. I've discovered that in, within Australia. People have never been presented with a clear message of the gospel. And 
even the knowledge of his will, they have no idea about. They're still guilty, but there's a, a total ignorance there in regards to they've never considered the fact that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. Are they a, need, a sinner in need of a Savior? Absolutely. But they've never considered that. And what we see, uh, there's a man named Warren Wearsby who, sa- who said this, Satan is so deceptive. He likes to use Christian vocabulary, but does not use the Christian dictionary. He takes, we, Satan takes knowledge and thinking that we have education and we have all these things laid out and then we must be smart. And we realize it simply goes back to what is the will of God in our life? What is God and how is God working in your life today? The second thing we see, it says be filled with knowledge. The second thing we see is to be filled with wisdom and understanding. And it says in the verse number 9, with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Wisdom, of course, is the common definition of that is the right use of knowledge. There's a general will that God has for all people. He says, a knowledge of his will in wisdom and spiritual understanding. There's a general will that God has for all men. And I joined Pastor Ben's D group this evening, and they quoted from 1 Peter where it talks about the fact that God does not wish that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we have a general will that God has for all people. God wants people to know him as Savior. But then we've come to that, that wisdom and spiritual understanding. There's a specific will. And the joy is that your individual gifts and abilities and opportunities, the things that have molded and shaped you, God can use those rather than being a detriment. And the things that are seemingly inabilities in your life become God's abilities. And they have a, what's known as a specific will. For my wife and myself, I am sure that God has specifically called us to Australia as missionaries. But more specifically than that, when we spent time in prayer and fasting and saying, God, what do you want us to do? He specifically led us to Bunbury. And I like to think of it in a way that I would like to say that Bunbury came to us through some spiritual, you know, big vision. Oh, in reality, it came to us by a seemingly mistake. About 13 years ago, when my children were quite young, we were driving through and around Bunbury. And where we lived previously was about two hours north. And the typical thing with children, you're traveling and you're, things are few and far between in, in Australia when you travel in the, in the remote areas. And I knew that my children needed to stop and use the restroom. I told you, this is a spiritual story. And so I told them as we were past at McDonald's, because we have McDonald's in Australia, and do you need to stop? No, we don't need to stop. We stop by, we passed by a gas station. Do you need to stop? No, we don't need to stop. And the last place we could possibly stop before we had another like 50 miles until the next town, they were desperate. It was like 30 seconds between the questions. And so we pulled into a community called Dayelup. Now, Dayelup is a community specifically that we, we live and minister in. We live in the, the city of Bunbury, but Dayelup is our community. And Dayelup is a word that's an Aboriginal word that literally means place of still frothy water. It's a nice way of saying swamp. And so Dayelup is our community. And we pulled into this community because the kids were desperate. And we had been praying the day before and the day of, God, where do you want us to go? Where do you want us to start a church? And we pulled into this community. And at that time, we, my wife and I looked at each other. And we said, wow, there's people here. And we started doing research and demographics. And we realized there was a need in that community. And soon after that, we moved there, not knowing anyone, and started a church. And we look at that and we say, God, we think that you somehow orchestrated my children's bladder to lead us to go into this community that we would have driven past every day of the week and we would have never stopped in and we would have considered somewhere else. But God, you stopped us and you had a specific will for our lives. Now, I don't think God works in my children's bladders in your lives. But at the same time is, you can see we want wisdom and understanding. What is the will of God? In Ephesians chapter 5, 
There's a lot of parallel teaching between Colossians and Ephesians. And it says in verses 17 and 18, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein it is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That word filled with the Spirit has the understanding of to be controlled by. To be controlled by God's Spirit. How is God molding and shaping you in in your lives? When you are filled with anger, what's controlling you? Anger is controlling you. When you are filled with jealousy, you are controlled by jealousy. When you are filled with lust, Lust is controlling you. When you are filled with the Spirit of God, who's controlling you? Who's molding and shaping and guiding you in wisdom and understanding? And that's a prayer. And so the Apostle Paul says, pray for knowledge. Pray for wisdom and understanding. And when you are filled with the will of God, you are naturally going to be obedient to the work of God in your life. And that becomes practical obedience. So it begins this prayer with saying, as you pray, pray for knowledge, pray for wisdom and understanding. And you can pray that for yourself. You can also pray that for others around you. Pray that the unsaved person will have knowledge of the fact that there's a Savior. Pray that they'll have wisdom of God to, to respond correctly. And then from that, we move on. Not only do we see a prayer to be filled, as in crammed, filled with knowledge and wisdom and understanding, we also see the next part, as that passage continues on in Colossians. And we have a path which says, be full. And verse 10 says, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. My... Worst subject in Bible college was Greek. (laughs) So that's why online commentaries are so helpful. And I looked up the word all there in in the Greek. And do you know what it literally means? All. You're brilliant. It means all. It's not a hidden word there where it's trying to confuse us. It, It says walk worthy of the Lord and do all pleasing, all and every, always and whole. There's different stages of our spiritual walk and life, and we can celebrate every single one of them. Those of you who have young children, when you have a young child that's just learning how to walk and they're taking their their really wobbly first steps, you don't look at them and go, what's wrong with you, stupid? Why don't you get up and walk properly? What do you do? You celebrate every step that they make, and they take that first step, And then they fall over and you're cheering and they've taken one step. And then along the way, they they don't walk all the time and then you're putting everything high. You wish you would have pushed them over a little more so they wouldn't walk so much. But you celebrate every single step along the way. And here it says in this pathway, we're called to walk worthy of what? The Lord. And every step of the way, we can be pleasing to God. That right there gives me great encouragement. Because I don't know the specifics of each and every one of you. But we can talk generally. If you're here tonight, I'm going to suggest that you probably are growing in your relationship with God. You have a desire to grow in your relationship with God. You have a desire to see other people come to know Christ as your Savior. So you start to see your neighbor differently. You, You begin to take the Word of God and you reflect it upon your own life and say, well, my prayer is that I'll have knowledge and wisdom and understanding but also I want to be full and I want to walk worthy of everything that God has called me to be. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, that's focused, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So here we see, we see four different areas that we're called to be full of. And filled with, and I'll give you some illustrations, and we'll talk about Australia a little bit as we go along. But what we see, first of all see is be full of service. Verse 10 says, All pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. This is every good work. And that's talking about the normal daily routine of life. That's something that's 
jumped out at me in the practical sense. Moving into a community where I didn't know anyone, and I still have many people that I need to meet, is walking through the streets, and every single person is a stranger. And it, it, sh- it shocked me in that I came to some big aha moment that's really, really obvious. Every single person is a stranger. If I'm going to talk to someone, I have to talk to a stranger. I know that's really obvious. And then you realize how unsaved people, now you have to talk about spiritual things and start broaching the subject of not just sports and the weather and how, you, how the kids are doing in school. Now you need to talk about what they really need to hear about. And what I'm, I've discovered is that that act of daily service does become a little easier over time. But when you're simply doing what it is that God has called you to do in the, in the normal, seemingly mundane things of life, God opens up other doors of opportunity and doors of service that you had no idea about. Like for instance, this tomorrow morning at 4 a.m., I'm going to be awake if my alarm goes off. Because I have an online meeting with a school board. I'm the chair of a school board of a, of a public uh, elementary school in, in Australia. And I'm, I'm chairing a meeting at 4 a.m. And so I'll be awake. And with the, that opened up a door of opportunity for us to, to serve and to, to care for a, a local elementary school. And when they need something, guess who they call? They call Southwest Baptist Church. This last year, there, we were invited by the school, as my wife Tammy and I, to run a program for six months with the, the sixth grade class of that school. Because in Australia, elementary school goes all the way up to the sixth grade, and high school goes from year seven to year 12. And so we ran a program for six months. They knew that they were inviting Christians into the public school to run a program. But because we had been there in the seemingly mundane, they trusted us enough to come in. Over the last several years, we ran a similar program for all the eighth graders in the public high school. And we run it, we run it all year along. And when we get back, we'll start it in, in the end of April, we'll start that program again in the local public high school. And what it comes about is simply, God, we're doing what God has called us to do, then the doors of opportunity open up. As opposed to the opposite of that is sitting back and going, why isn't God doing anything? Why isn't God working or opening up doors of opportunity? But when you're out there, God opens the doors of service. So it says there, all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. And it goes on and says, be full of knowledge. And it goes and says something really frustrating. It says increasing in knowledge. I would like to think that I know enough, but I know I don't. And we're constantly learning and growing. And this becomes a prayer of saying, God, will you give me service? Will you give other people service? But also, Will you help me to know enough? And something I've discovered, and maybe your pastor Ben is similar, we'll sit there and talk with people, and often my favorite thing to do is to sit at a cafe with someone over a cup of coffee, and I'm sitting there holding it, because for some reason, men, we get brave when we have a cup of coffee in front of us. No coffee, we're weak, but we have, we're brave in front of us with a cup of coffee. And we'll sit there, and people will share, and I'm sitting there going, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm listening away at the, at the issue and problem. And inside I'm thinking, God, I have no idea what I'm going to say yet next. I have no idea. And it's amazing. Every single time God brings a Bible verse or he brings a passage to my mind and going, here's what you need to say exactly the right time. It, wasn't, it was something that God had placed in me. That's why I'm so thrilled to see you, you memorizing Scripture and it being constantly in front of you because you may look at the verse that you you. Memorize this week and memorize next week in Genesis 15. And you know, what am I going to do with that? What you're doing is you're giving God ammunition, that knowledge, so that when you do need it, God has something to draw from and bring it out. So when you're sitting there like I am with someone and going, I have no way to want to say, God, you better give me some words to say. It's amazing. Those verses come to your mind exactly the right time, the right context, and you can be used by God. So he says, Be pleasing to God, increasing in the knowledge of God. Another way of saying that is like a prayer saying, God, increase my capacity to love. 
until I love you with all my heart, my soul, my strength, and my mind, and love my neighbor as myself. God, help me to see people the way that you see them. Love them the way that you love them. The passage continues on into verse number 11. And we see power, which I like that word power, because that's where you get the word, the, the, from the Greek, you get the word dynamite from. So this is explosive power. And it says, all pleasing, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. God takes what we, the seemingly small and insignificant gifts and abilities that you have and makes them powerful. And he takes something that's weak. Um, my, for my personal testimony is public speaking to me used to terrify me. Believe me, you don't scare me anymore. But public speaking used to terrify me. And I remember feeling a, a call of God to, Michael, I want you to be a pastor. I want you to minister to people. And in seemingly humility, but really in fear, I would respond, but God, I can't speak. And God has to do work in my, my heart. And I realize every single time I get up, I mean this sincerely, this is a work of God. It's not natural to be comfortable in front of, of people, at least not for me. And the response when God works, and you see how God uses your seemingly small, insignificant gifts and abilities, then you know what the natural response is with power? Is the word wow. There's a really deep spiritual word here is the word wow. And maybe this week as you go through life and you have the seemingly small mundane things and you experience the knowledge of God and you experience uh, the power of God in your life, maybe you need to respond with this big spiritual word, wow, God, this week. So I'm going to plant that in your mind and maybe by Wednesday you'll come up with a wow moment. And you'll say, God, you could only do this. This morning when I showed the video and I, I challenged you to look at the faces because every single person has a unique story. And I, I mean, I know their stories and I know what people have come from and I realize those are just a bunch of faces on the, on the screen. But when we realize that every single one of them knows Jesus Christ as their Savior now because of churches like you and you get to be part of that, I think a good natural response is, Wow, look, look at what God has done. So we're challenged in that prayer to pray for, for, for my own notes, we're to be filled with, if we to be filled with knowledge and be filled with wisdom and understanding. And then from that, we're called to be full. Full of what? Full of service and knowledge and power. And then the final thing the Apostle Paul challenged us to pray for is the word thanks. The natural thing is to return to God when we see how he's worked in our lives and go, God, you're the only one that could have done this. God, you're the only one that could have saved me from my sins. You're the only one that can change people's hearts and lives. As brilliant as you are, you're never going to be clever enough to convince someone of the gospel. And it says in verse 12, you know, that all pleasing, giving thanks unto God the Father. I mentioned earlier about liking to take people out for coffee. And the coffee in Australia really is excellent coffee. I mean, if you like Starbucks, and it's excellent coffee there. And so this is an illustration I like to think of, is after you take someone for coffee, it's very good and good manners to say thank you. Thank you for the cup of coffee. Today I went over to Jennings house, and it's good to report that Megan Jennings, you're an excellent cook. Thank you for, for, for lunch today. I'm still, thank you. And we, depending on the expense of the gift, Depends on how long and how deep you say thank you. So you buy someone a $5 cup of coffee, and it's good and polite to say thank you very much for the cup of coffee. It would be really weird in one week's time, say, Michael, thank you so much for that cup of coffee. It was so good. And even weirder in six months' time or 12 months' time to go, do you know what? Today is the 12-month anniversary of that cup of coffee that you bought me. That's a really weird thing to do. 
On the other side, when someone has come and died for you and given you life when you had death and given us that exchange when we deserve death and he's given us life and hope and joy and peace and all the wonderful attributes of the Christian life that we enjoy, the natural thing that we say, well, give thanks. That is more than just, thank you, God. Every single day, my personal prayer, I thank God. Thank you, God, for my salvation. And it's nothing that is rote or it shouldn't be rote. It's constantly thinking, God, wow, look at what you've done and look what I can be grateful for. So I want to encourage you as a church, you have missions letters and you have, you have impact and you read those things. And, and this morning you, you read of the goaches in, in the Philippines and the amount of people that come, come to know the Lord as a Savior. I want you to be able to say, wow, thank you, God, for how you're making an impact and allowing us to be part of that. So as we come to a conclusion this, this evening, I want you to realize that we have a new identity in Christ. And we also have a new prayer that we can pray for ourselves and for other people. And the joy of that is that we're doing it for something bigger and greater than just ourselves. So my encouragement to you as you go out, yes, you should say, thank you, God. But do so with the aspect of, wow, God, look at what you're doing. Wow, God, look what you're allowing me to do in and through my life. And we turn that around a little bit. I'm going to go back to the conclusion from Sunday morning's message. Maybe you're at the point where you're realizing that your faith or your love or your hope has been stagnant for a while. Or it has been maybe going backwards and shrinking. And maybe this prayer can be an encouragement and a help to you to say, I don't want to live that way any longer. God, will you work in my heart and my life, change me, mold me, and shake me into who you want me to be. I don't know how you want to conclude this evening. Let me pray with you. And as I pray, I'm going to invite you, just like I did this morning, to silently pray along with me, asking God to work in your hearts and your lives. Let's pray together.